the next theory we'll talk about is ethic of care. And ethic of care is really about building valuable relationships with everybody. And this is a big issue in marketing. It's a very big issue in human resource management. And when we think about this in terms of stakeholder analysis, as we talked about in Chapter 1, <clears throat> the ethic of care is about making sure we're building good relationships with all of our stakeholders. And in doing that, of course, we don't want to, quote unquote, screw over any of our uh, stakeholders on a consistent basis. And there's a big difference between saying no to a stakeholder and screwing them over. And what I mean by the difference is when I am saying no to someone, it doesn't mean I'm going to say no every time. It means maybe in this circumstance I have to say no to them. But when we're screwing somebody over, that means we're consistently and regularly ignoring their needs and taking advantage of them. And that then devalues the relationship we have with them so that we end up in the end not being able to uh, have a good relationship with those candidates. So, I mean, not, I mean, with those stakeholders. So it is important for us to recognize when we are considering ethical ethics and ethical decision making, it's an ethic of care and how we interact with each other. With each other. If you recall, we talked about Carol Gilligan's work about how women and men tend to have different moral development in the way they think about what is moral or ethical. And this is a great example of a theory that really gets at not just this notion that everything has to be rational and logical in the, in the approach to things, but more so that it is highlighting and valuing the way women make ethical decisions, which is about relationship building and how important that is for long-term business relationships. So the textbook covers Malden Mills and what happened in Malden Mills. And here's a great example of their ethic of care. They didn't shut down the factory. They didn't move operations to another country, which many companies do because they don't have loyalty to the people who have been working for them. And they continued to pay their employees while the factory was being rebuilt. I would also point out to you, after 9-11, there was an organization called Cantor Fitzgerald, which was unfortunately on one of the floors that were directly hit by the air, by the first airplane, I think, that, that hit the World Trade Center towers. If not the first, it certainly was the second one. Um, and even though the company was not functioning and even though so many of their people died, they continued to pay salaries for those employees um, who had died and their families were still depending on that income. They um, made sure that the company was still making payments even though they weren't operational. So again, this notion that we should care about people as human beings, as part of our larger communal family, is really important. Now, people like Milton Friedman would argue, well, we don't owe that. We don't owe people that. We only owe shareholders, you know, money. Um, and and there's many good arguments for doing that. But at the same time, we also recognize when we treat people like they matter to us, that the relationship that we're building with them matters. We're making an investment in a long-term relationship, not just a short-term relationship. So I think it's it's very important that we consider not just profitability and shareholder values, but also the values for all how we value all of our stakeholders in that process. So Malden Mills, Cantor Fitzgerald, these are all great examples of companies that engage in what we call an ethic of care. There are, of course, just like all the other theories, uh, criticisms of the ethic of care. Number one, that it reflects unjust favoritism. And I understand that because if we are taking care of people in a deeper way, it may feel like it is favoritism that we are treating people um, differently and not not consistently. Um, so it could reek of favoritism and, in, and also that it's demanding and can lead to burnout. And I would agree with that to some extent as well, because again, if we are um, exporting our energy to love and support others and to, to exhibit care for them, it's certainly not unreasonable to expect that as we are trying to care for others that it ultimately it could lead to burnout on our part. And so I would highly recommend uh, the focus that we would take is much more about balance. 
right? That it's not just all ethic of care, that maybe what we would want to do is make sure that we are taking care of people, but not in such a way that it burns us out. I think there's a little bit of truth in all of these theories that we should try to put together to develop a plan of attack about how we handle people and how we handle ethical and moral decision making. Um, so this sort of gets at some of my concerns, of course, as well, right? How do we make sure that we are balancing all that needs to be done for our clients and um, ensuring that they are being taken care of the best way possible? And that means we have to consider not just one ethical theory, but multiple ethical theories in the process. And that transitions us into this next section, which is exactly what I was arguing, how important it is for us to integrate all the ethical theories, all the ethical norms of decision making, that we should integrate the utility analysis, analysis utilitarianism, the rights and duties analysis, universalism, the justice lens from Rawls and the caring of uh, the, the ethics of caring or the caring ethics. And how important it is for all four of those to be worked together. Each of them have very distinctive standards. So can and should we be making decisions integrating all four of these? That we want to make sure solutions maximize benefits and minimize harm, respect the moral rights for all, promote a just distribution of benefits and burdens, and exhibit appropriate care for all of our stakeholders. I think we can come up with solutions like this. And the, the challenge is, of course, that a lot of people don't want to put the effort into it. And uh, and this is what the purpose of this class is, is to encourage you to recognize how important it is to put in the effort to analyze and make sure these decisions are, the, are addressing these four um, ethical theories and norms about the way we want to approach things. This is just a graphic from the textbook that sort of highlights what that process would look like. We start with those four different comparable, complementary uh, moral standards, the social utility, the moral rights, the distributive justice issues of Rawls, and then the exercising care for our stakeholders. We can then gather that factual information concerning the policies, um, institution, or behaviors under consideration, and then ultimately we make our moral judgment. As you engage in your discussion boards, I'm going to have you use this process to make decisions together as a group. There are three discussion boards, um, so you're going to have to start coordinating with individuals in the class. You can work virtually. That's not a problem, but it is important that we uh, practice this, this um, process of ethical decision making in that manner. So wrapping that up about how we integrate all of those different theories, they do relate to each other in many ways. And so our moral standards need to include all four elements, net utility, respect for everybody's individualist rights, good just distribution of benefits and burdens, and caring for those in concrete relations to us. So all four of those should be considered in the process. Some might get more weight than another, but in all of them, they should be part of that discussion, part of that decision-making process. The fifth theory out there that I like to include in this whole process is about virtue ethics and how we consider the virtues of um, the uh, decision maker and how our communities determine what is considered to be moral or ethical. So Aristotle came up with this notion of virtue ethics because he believes that we are obligated to engage in moral virtues that is this reasonable point between extremes, so a balanced point. And I think that this works really nicely in alignment with the idea of integrating all four of those other theories, and it complements that by saying the actors should engage with virtue. Um, 
and to be the role model that they think they should be. So the way this basically works is recognizing that when a situation happens, what would be the virtuous response and what would be the vice um, and what would be the two extremes? Too much excess or not enough um, where we're deficient means that we need to find the virtuous point in the middle. Now, the challenge with virtue ethics is that it's very contextual. For example, it's dependent on the local community. It's dependent on the context. And I remember reading this article a number of years ago when they were talking about building um, the dorms for people for the Olympic Games. I know this is kind of a weird analogy, but it makes it'll make sense when I explain it. When they are deciding on food service for the athletes, they have to accommodate diets all along the spectrum. Every different athlete uh, adheres to a different diet, a different way of thinking about things. And for example, they talked about the difference between the large heavyweight wrestlers or heavyweight boxers and what they will eat um, and how um, and what would be considered appropriate for them as compared to uh, gymnasts or ice skaters who have a very different type of diet and in fact may not eat the same way and certainly do not eat the same way as, as um, um, boxers or wrestlers do. And what would be considered overeating for a gymnast would be completely appropriate for a boxer or a wrestler. So it is very contextual. So what is considered to be a virtue or a vice or what is considered to be excessive at either of the extremes is going to differ when you're thinking about a gymnast versus a wrestler. So a wrestler, it might be considered a vice to not eat enough, whereas for a gymnast, what a, what a wrestler eats would be considered the vice. It's, it's too much for them. And, and I want you to think about that in the context of the issue of um, what is considered to be virtuous or the ethical norm that we want to engage in. And we might say, well, that seems like that would be virtuous, but virtuous to whom and under what situation would it be virtuous? So when we're thinking about virtue ethics, we it, it helps us to consider those four the integration of those four lenses, the utility, the rights, the justice, and the caring ethics, and how they are really dependent on context and what is appropriate in one context may not be appropriate in another. This is not quite overlap with, um, with relativism um, because this really does try to find what would be an appropriate approach to things. But um, nonetheless, it's, it's something to consider that it, it does border on the, this, this notion of what is considered to be uh, relativistic because it has to take into account what the community says. But what, how it differs is that virtue ethics is truly trying to find what is the right thing to do. Um, that is part of its quest, if you will. Um, and so when we're evaluating ethical actors, we consider, right, what kind of behaviors did they gauge in? given the circumstances and would it be considered greedy or would it consider be considered to be completely appropriate and i like the examples they gave from quest communications about some of the moral vices that we saw in quest we taught we saw issues of greed we saw issues of that culture of fear and how important it is for us to consider the behaviors of the individual relative to what the appropriate norms are for behaviors in an industry, in a community, in a country, et cetera, et cetera. Virtue ethics are very dependent on context, and so we have to take that into account. So the golden mean, um, Aristotle talks about that reasonable space, the virtuous space in between the two extremes of either deficiency or excess. Um, and the next slide, we'll, we'll get into that in a, few, in, a, um, in a little bit more detail. So here is the, a great summary of how the golden mean works. The third column over where it says virtuous mean of emotion or action is our golden mean. That's what we want to see in terms of behaviors 
Again, how we define it is going to depend on context to context. But when we think about the emotion of fear, right, and and what is the virtuous response to fear? It should be courage. We don't want it to be the deficient position, which is cowardliness, and like the cowardly lion, right, in the in the Wizard of Oz. And we don't want it to be the other extreme of recklessness. Well, because I am in a place of fear, I am going to be completely reckless because I'm going to do everything I can to erase my fear. Courage is about this temperance between being cowardly and being reckless. It's the it's that that middle ground, if you will. For pleasure, right? Self-deprivation, that doesn't work. Self-indulgent, that doesn't work. But that middle ground of temperance, recognizing when it's appropriate to indulge, how the level at which we should indulge in pleasure, and, and when we need to say no. Um, because obviously self-indulgence can create a lot of problems for people, but so does deprivation, this notion that we don't deserve pleasure or comfort or happiness, right? So each one of these items is is dealing with that golden mean, which is the third column over, and the excessive behavior or emotion related to um, the emotion or the, the deficiency of it one way or the other. And, and our goal is to try to find where the virtue mean is, where that golden mean is for our behaviors, which, as I said, would be different from place to place. So when we talk about hunger, right, gluttony for the wrestler is different than gluttony for the gymnast. For the gymnast, eating more than maybe a thousand calories a day would be considered gluttonous versus for the wrestler, 2000 or 3000 calories a day would be completely appropriate because their muscle mass is burning calories in a different way or their body is burning calories in a different way because of their muscle mass is probably the more appropriate way of, of thinking about that. So our goal is to figure out where that virtuous mean is and consider it in the context of the situation that we're dealing with. Continuing on with the discussion of virtue ethics, as I said, virtue ethics is really about the character of the actor and who is making the decision and what are the things that drive them to behave either um, virtuously or, in, you know, in, you know, in negatively. Um, and we evaluate the moral behaviors of someone based on the rightness or the wrongness of their virtues or vices. So it depends on the context. Um, and it it depends on what I would consider to be virtuous or, or a vice, um, depends on, on obviously on the situation. So there isn't a uniform way of saying, you know, that you know, gluttony means the same thing for everybody. Gluttony doesn't mean the same thing for everybody. Um, starving themselves doesn't mean the same thing for everybody. I mean, yes, I mean, objectively, not eating anything would be starving, but the amount of calories needed for the gymnast is different than the amount of calories needed for the wrestler, as I said before. Some of the criticisms, of course, is that virtue theory doesn't seem consistent with psychology. Um, and that's quite true because, again, the field of psychology really did not take off until far, uh, far after um, you know, Aristotle did his work. But if we think about this as recognizing, number one, you know, how important virtues being virtuous is, that temperance, that middle ground is so important because anything at the extremes can be dangerous. Um, it doesn't mean that sometimes we can't go to the extreme. Sometimes we, we need those extreme behaviors. But maybe one could argue, of course, that even though we might consider it extreme in one context, given the circumstances, it's not so uh, extreme after all. Um, but the goal of how this aligns, again, with utilitarianism and, and the moral rights theory, universalism and the justice theories and care theories is that character and the character of the individual is what's emphasized, making sure that we engage in appropriate uh, behaviors uh, consistent with a character of one who wants to be or should be ethical. So that is um, some of the pros and cons of, of virtue ethics. And our last slide will deal with this notion of conscious and unconscious moral decisions. And 
the way that it breaks down is the X system is our unconscious moral decision making process. And it is a process by which our brain has ingrained or has hired wired ways of doing things. And we, we know sort of fundamentally what is right or what is wrong um, in that situation. And the C system is the conscious. And our goal, of course, is to bring our X system to consciousness. And that's what ca- casuistry is, which is, is how we take that unconscious moral decision making process to make it more conscious for us so that we are aware of what that process actually looks like. And in, in, and our goal here is because we, when we're making decisions, we look back on what, what the textbook calls these prototypes. And, and really what they are, if we go into the deeper decision making literature, is it's, it's heuristics. It's the rules. It's the standards by which our brain assesses the world through perception and makes a decision about what we should do based on past experience and based on the current situation. And it works a lot like case law does in a law, right, where it says, well, this was wrong. Is this the same situation? You know, the law says X, right? And so we can look at something and go, the law says this is wrong. But is this situation the same? Are there subtle differences? Why is it different? And is it different enough that would render us to consider a different situation? And this is basically how case law works here in the United States, where we interpret laws over time and try to figure out um, how do we make sense of the law and how do we fine tune the law. So what casuistry is trying to do is kind of fine tune our interpretations of our moral intuition and our moral reasoning on a regular basis. This is all part of moral psychology. Remember what I said. Ethics, you know, virtue ethics really did not come about and, you know, during the time of, of more, the study of moral psychology. It preceded it by hundreds and hundreds of years. And and so moral psychology is really much more um, astute and really understanding motivations and intuition and decision making process and all those sorts of things. And so here's an example. I like this example at the bottom of the page where it talks about examples of moral intuition. We have a hardwire intuition seems to include the following that incest is wrong and that harming by action is worse than harming by omission. Um, harming as a means to a goal is worse than harming as a foreseen side effect. So if we're harming with the intention to harm, that's different than harming that happens to happen as, it just happens to randomly happen as a side effect. Harming by physical contact is worse than harming by, um, is worth it without physical contact. So if I don't have physical contact with you but you're harmed, that is less onerous less problematic than if I touched you, I made contact with you. Um, So you can see where these extremes are, right? That something is hardwired um, in us, but then we understand some of the nuances to why it might be more or less good in some circumstances. So incest is wrong, maybe. Some cultures believe it's okay. Some cultures give children... um, you know, give give people authority on that. I firmly disagree that incest is okay, obviously. Um, but we can understand, right, that there are some hardwired intuitions about about things. And, you know, where does that come from? Well, at the end of the day, it comes from our drive for genetic diversity. And our, even our bodies understand and know Right. At a, at a fundamentally deep level, there's a lot of research out there that says our bodies carry these sorts of knowledge and um, and carry that sort of knowledge with us um, over generations. And it's sort of embedded in our DNA. Some of these uh, these noted issues, it's hard to understand. Right. You know where the source of that information comes from. Some people would call it God. But I think in, in so much uh, of that can also be understood at a deeper level uh, scientifically. Um that we recognize that incest does not end up with genetic diversity. And when we don't have genetic diversity, um, humans develop um, disorders and die. Um, and so our the survival rate, the robustness of the, the DNA in the, um, in the situation would be um, obviously problematic. So 
I think that there is a way that our that that hardwired intuition is there for us to truly understand that incest is problematic. Um, even if some people might argue that it's OK, um, we all argue, I think, fundamentally that it's wrong from a moral perspective, but also from a biological perspective. We will die if we engage in incest. Right. And that's why, you know, genetic diversity matters in conservation, in, in the human you know, lifespan, why would we intentionally and purposefully um, choose to couple with somebody that creates known genetic disorders in um, in our children? Um, and so that's a, a, cons a consideration to be made. Um, so again, harming by action is worse than omission. So if I intentionally harm um, versus by, by, by purposely doing something versus forgetting to do something, um, you know, it's worse when we do it and we create harm than when we forget to do something and create harm. Um, so you can see how these uh, extremes kind of work here.